In the late 90s, I remember watching a video from the 70s by an English philosopher called Alan Watts. He was describing the universe as a place where all things are wiggling. For me, this was an aha moment of understanding. Look at the motion of these branches under the wind. Outside my window, look at the shape of the edge of the trees. Think about sand dunes. Think about the ridge of a mountain. Think about the surface of the ocean. Or even think about how spermatozoids move around. In physics, we do not use the word wiggles, but the word waves. Okay? But what is a wave? Do waves physically exist? Or are these just a mathematical concept invented by the human mind? In this video, I will not give you an absolute answer to that question. I believe nobody can. Instead, see my approach at the borderline of physics and philosophy. The goal here is to give you some starting points on which you can reflect yourself. Let's consider a rope. A rope is made of molecules which are tied to each other. So we can model it like particles which have bonds between each other. Here I represented the rope, or the particles in the rope, at rest, at time zero. I apply a force on the first particle upwards, meaning that I'm taking the rope and I'm applying a force upwards like this, and then I will start to apply a force downwards and upwards and downwards. You see where I'm going. So what happens after some time? I've got the first particle, which has been accelerated upwards, so it gained velocity upwards, so it started moving upwards. And because it is upwards compared to the equilibrium position, it started to pull the second one. There is a bond between them. These two particles depend on each other. If one moves, the other one will feel a motion too, it will feel a force too. I haven't finished with the first particle. I'm still bringing it up even higher to its maximum position, its amplitude. Therefore, this one is pulled even more. And we'll pull the other one also, which might even start pulling the fourth one. But I'm not done with the first particle. I brought this particle to its maximum position, meaning that I arrived to the maximum position, stopped, and started to pull down. Therefore, now, this particle is at a lower position, closer to the equilibrium point. So, the neighbor is feeling a force downwards. So, an acceleration downwards. But it has still velocity upwards, meaning that it is decelerating. It's still going upwards, and it will reach its maximum position. Let's say it's here. And because it is at its maximum position, it will pull the other particles even more. Now let's continue, and I'm bringing this particle back to its equilibrium position. Well, this one already reached its maximum, so now it's going to go down too, pulled by the first particle. While this particle now will reach the maximum position, pulling even more the fourth particle, which pulls the fifth. And what do you observe here? Is a shape that emerges. A wave emerges. Think about it. I made a single particle wiggle. And because of the dependence between this particle and its neighbors, a wave emerged. One could consider a wave like an emergent property that appears at larger scales. What is an emergent property? Well, it's when a specific property appears when the observer changes scale in space, in time, or both. Temperature is a great example of an emergent property. You see, in the macroscopic world, temperature does not exist. This property emerges only when the observer changes perspectives and places himself in a macroscopic scale, in a larger scale. 
the temperature of a system is proportional to the average kinetic energy of the particles that form that system. Each individual particle does not have a temperature. It has a kinetic energy. Let me give you a practical example. When you touch something and it is hot, it only means that the kinetic energy of the particles composing that object is high. And we, at our scale, we perceive it as high temperature. So, we could say that waves are emergent shapes. It's a fun idea. And it could be quite useful conceptually. But I do find this idea quite limitative. Here's why. Imagine a spring which is laid horizontally on a frictionless surface. The spring has a spring constant k, and at the extremity of the spring there is a mass m at f. Imagine now that I pull the spring with a force f, such as I arrive to a displacement of the mass m x max. A maximum displacement. Why maximum? Because at the moment when I reach this point, I stop applying the force f. So, what do you think will happen to the mass? Well, naturally, instinctively, we know that it will go back and forth. It will oscillate. Let's try to understand that and try to get a mathematical expression of this oscillation. Here, when I release the force F here, so there's no more force F, there will be a return force, F prime, and F prime will be equal to minus kx. I chose to the right as positive. This is Hooke's law. This is the only force on the mass m, therefore it's also the net force. So I can apply the second law of Newton on it and say that f prime is also equal to ma, meaning that I can rearrange this equation to get a equals minus k over m x. Acceleration is the rate of change of velocity. Velocity is a rate of change of position. So I could write a very complicated equation. A is a rate of change of the rate of change of the position. That's not very pretty. I prefer to write it like this, d squared x over dt squared, which is also seen as x point point. I take the double variation of the position to get the acceleration. I will put this expression in this equation and then rearrange this to get something a bit more pretty. So I get d squared x over dt squared plus k over m x equals zero. What is x here? x is not a number. x is a function. It tells you what is the position of the mass m at any moment in time? So it's actually x of t. So I could even rewrite it, d squared x of t over dt squared plus k over m x of t equals zero. The solution of this equation is actually a function that appears as itself, but also as a variation of itself. This is called a differential equation, and there are techniques to solve them and find a solution. In early university, you will learn how to solve differential equations, meaning how to find a function that satisfies these conditions. Here, I will just give you the solution. The solution function that satisfies this equation is x of t equals x max, the amplitude, yes, by cosine of square root of k over m t. This gives you the position of the mass m at any time. What's interesting is that it follows a cosine curve. Inside its motion, there's a wave. So a wave is not just an emergent shape. It was already there, hidden within the mathematics of the motion of the oscillator. What I find fascinating is that the shape of the mechanical wave that shows up is a representation of a microscopic oscillation, like if we were looking through a microscope. 
The fundamental nature of the wiggles that Alan Watts discussed in his video shows up in the math. You see, one doesn't need to dive into quantum mechanics and Schrodinger's wave functions to realize how waves are fundamental pillars of our description of the universe. Classical Newtonian physics are sufficient to realize this. So where are we now in understanding what a wave is? It appeared at first to be an emergent shape generated by the motion of dependent oscillators. But now we just realize that it is also at the heart of physical processes, like the oscillations themselves. Waves are indeed starting to take a lot of place in our description of the universe. There is another conceptual tool that is fundamental and that we use continuously when modeling the dynamics of our world. Energy. We will see now that waves and energy are intimately linked. Let's get back to the rope. Remember, I was holding the rope by its extremity, i.e. holding the first particle of the rope. And then I applied a force up and down and set it in motion. Because this particle was bonded with its neighbors, the neighbors started to be set in motion too. Uh, they all start to oscillate, and what emerges is a wave. So you see this wave propagating now along the rope. When I applied the force on the first particle, I set it in motion, so I actually gave it energy. I worked on the rope. I worked on this particle. And this energy was kind of transferred from one particle to the other. Look at this one, for example. Here, this wave is formed from the oscillation of all these particles. These particles are oscillating, therefore they have energy. The particles before are not oscillating. They don't have any energy. They're not moving. They used to, but they're not anymore. So when I see this, I see this like a pack of energy which is moving along the rope. The wave here acts a little bit like a vehicle that transports energy. I kind of like this idea because when you're seeing a wave moving, say uh, on a lake, for example, what you're actually seeing is the motion of energy. Okay, so let me uh, show you a more pragmatic example, of a more practical example. Imagine one of my girlfriends And she's really happy, you know, she's really happy because uh, she's participating in a physics experiment. She's holding a rope. And somewhere along the rope, there is an air balloon. And the air balloon is such as the rope is just underneath it, you know. So my friend applies a pulse. So she actually works on the, the rope. That creates a little packet of energy under the form of a pulse here, a little wave. And this wave is going to move towards the air balloon. It propagates along the rope. What do you think will happen when the pulse reaches the air balloon? Well, the particles will start to oscillate upwards, pushing the air balloon upwards. So we will be in this situation. But wait a minute. The air balloon now gained height, so it has potential energy. This energy was given by the rope to the balloon. So probably, most certainly, the pulse is actually smaller afterwards. If I step back a little and I look at the whole picture, what I see is my friend working on the rope, by transferring some energy to the rope, energy being transported towards the air balloon via the wave on the rope, and then given to the air balloon as potential energy. This is really a transfer of energy from one point to the other via a wave. So a wave is actually the way energy propagates. When you see a mechanical wave, you are actually seeing energy which is physically moving. It's like a vehicle that emerges when energy needs to move from one place to another. In this video, I gave you a few starting points for your own reflection on the nature of a wave. Let me know in the comments where your reflections bring you to. I hope you enjoyed this video. 
So don't forget to like, subscribe and hit the notification bell. It really encourages me to create new videos. In the meantime, I'll see you soon for another episode of Physics Made Easy. Ciao!